very, very, very warm welcome to this completely sold out event. My name is Helen Shenton. I'm the librarian and college archivist of Trinity College Dublin. I'm an occupant of the Barclay Library and I'm the steward of the Barclay Library. And we're absolutely delighted to welcome you to this event, which is the culmination of a year of celebration of the Barclay Library, which it's exactly 50 years ago since President M. de Valera opened it. And what we've been doing through the year is celebrating it in all sorts of ways. We started off with architectural uh, lectures, um, but to um, reflect the universality of the library as being at the heart of a university. We've had all sorts of events. We've done around philosophy with Bishop Bartley. We've done a um, celebration of Moog synthesizers, which are 50. So we had Moog at 50 with a professor of music. And over the summer, we had um, uh, psychedelic happenings in a 1960s vibe um, in the library with uh, underground uh, music and, and poetry and so on. We've had um, Lear Academy students do an immersive performance based on loosely on Crap's last tape. And one of the elements, um, we've just learned so much about uh, the Barclay Library, but um, uh, uh, Samuel Beckett, one of our most famous alumni, he was asked to write something to help fund the Barclay Library. Um, and what he did was that he donated a year's uh, royalties from Crap's last tape, which were on Broadway. So some uh, students did an immersive performance around that. Um, we've done wicker thumbs. Um, we've done, we've also, my steer to my colleagues, my fabulous colleagues, was have some fun. So I have to say we've also had a lot of fun. Uh, one of the things during this year is that we've learned an incredible amount about the Barclay Library. And um, I'll just share with you three things that I've learned. The first is, it's a Marmite building. People either love it or hate it. But then I actually find it's a special sort of Marmite building because people go from hating it to loving it. And I count myself amongst those. I was very reluctant occupant of the, the Barclay Library. I came about three years ago. I come from the bright snow of Massachusetts in February and I was walking up towards the Barclay Library on this dour, drab, dreary February afternoon when you think that all colour has disappeared out of the world. And I saw this big concrete block. And I, my office had been the, the second oldest building in Harvard Yard where Washington had slept and, and so on. And I looked at this thing and I thought, oh well, never mind. What has happened in the ensuing three years is that I have come to really appreciate the Barclay Library and really love it. And my observation is that um, I've talked to a lot of particular third years and fourth year undergraduates. They're the same. They say, oh, I didn't like it at first. But then people really come to love it. And we've also appreciated that and learned that from the um, so many alums as well. The second point um, that I've learned is that architects absolutely revere the Barclay Library. And so um, this year we're um, absolutely delighted. We've got some very ambitious programs on and uh, we're working with Hing and Peng. And the architects that we're working with, when um, they're working um, and looking at the Barclay Library and then the old library, the old library, even though the most beautiful room in Ireland, I've also heard it called the most beautiful room in the world, but it says nothing compared to their reverence for the uh, for Coralex um, um, staircase in the old library. <coughs> the third thing that I've really learned about uh, during this this um, this year is that it's not one building but two. 
So there's the monumentality of the Barclay Library, which we'll celebrate tonight. But then I've come to realise that there's another building, an invisible one, and that's outside, on the podium, on the plaza, piazza rather. And it not only brilliantly pulls together the 18th century old library with the 19th century museum building, with then the 20th century, the quintessential 20th century Barclay Library. So it pulls those three together, but it's actually, it operates like a building itself, like a negative space. I'm sure there's a phrase for this. Um, and it's a bit like if you have, you know, Philip Johnson's glass house is then reflected by the brick house. Or one thing we were talking about um, came out was um, uh, Taj Mahal. There it is, this beautiful white edifice. Well, Shah Jahan originally was going to have a black one as well, the other side of the river. So you would have seen these two black, white, or solid and, um, and invisible. The thing about the podium as well is that it's a panopticon. It's the only place on campus, on the, the village of, of Trinity, where you can look and see all four um, squares. So it's a very, very, very um, special. So the, <coughs> excuse me, the format for this evening um, is that um, we're here to celebrate the Barclay Library, but more than that, we're here to celebrate its creator, Paul Coronek. And the format is going to be, there's a conversation, and I should point out that these are chairs that were designed by Paul, uh, <laughs> that we've, uh, and also the tables are part of, designed uh, as part of the Barclay Library. So we have a conversation between Paul and John Toomey, uh, the world-renowned architect, um, and one of the things we've done for this evening is that John and Paul um, had a conversation, I think it was in 2003, in the printing house. Um, and as part of our celebration, uh, we've had it transcribed, and that's the pamphlet that's outside. It's going to be on, on sale afterwards. Um, and we're delighted that it's hot off the press. We've just um, got a transcription of that 2005 um, uh, um, um, conversation. And then, um, so uh, after that conversation, then we're going to invite um, Machine Hinnigan of Hinnigan Payne, fresh from the challenges and triumphs of the National Gallery of Ireland. And then Shane O'Toole, the um, renowned architectural critic. And then Karen Latimer, who probably knows more about library buildings than anyone. Uh, recently retired from Belf uh, Queen's Belfast, and there'll be a conversation, uh, and then uh, um, uh, the opportunity um, to have some questions at the end. So on that note, I'd like to warmly introduce John Toomey and Paul Coralek. say that uh, for, it's a pleasure to have this conversation that Paul and I had 12 years ago. It's a pleasure to have it between the covers of such an elegant publication. We said maybe there was the con makings of a pamphlet and I looked it up. Uh, a pamphlet can be five to eight pages so I think this has become a book <laughs> and it feels like a proper book. I want to thank you. Brenda Sorrell for helping me with the transcription of that book. Um, but you know, when we did this conversation 12 years ago, um, the way I started that day, because it was a sunny day and we were in the print works, I, uh, the printing house, I started by just walking around the building once to prepare my mind for our conversation. So I thought tonight before I popped into your office, I would do it again and just walk around the building once before I met um, the man himself. And you know, you walk around that building, no matter how many times you walk around that building. And I walked around it first when I was a student in, in first year architecture in 1971. We were set a project to choose the building we wanted to study as a space that interested us, interested us in architecture. And I chose to make a study model of the front lobby of 
the Barclay Library. And in this model, it was a two-face model. One side was the foyer of the Barclay, and on the other side was the portico of the printing house brought together into one kind of collage, badly made collage of the spaces. So you think you know this building, or I think I do, because I've known it all my architectural life. But I walked around it again tonight and thinking how solid this building is. And I was looking at the carved glass windows and I realized, of course they're carved, because carved glass by its viscosity is also, you know, even the glass is solid in this solidly sculpted building. And then stepping back into the um, panopticon that you described, the invisible space, that you described. I'm thinking, look at this array that Trinity holds in its um, care. 1732, the library around which the whole campus is constructed, Thomas Burr's library, which apparently was built in order to allow it to grow its collection without changing the building for 100 years. So it was empty of books, or rather empty when it started and only filled up gradually. And then about 100 years later, 1857, the uh, Dina Woodward Museum building is completed, an, an opposite and shining example of solid romanticism. And then in 1967, the new library steps in between, steps back between those two buildings, and you get one, two, three centuries, and I suppose it might be said, the finest buildings of those centuries collected together in a row, and maybe the finest works by those architects um, in this city, on this island. Um, so, now we have Paul Karlak here to answer for himself a couple of questions that we thought we might be interested in, not, not to replay this conversation, which you have to read for yourselves, but just to talk about some points that come up in, in the mind about things that Paul might like to respond to or might like to develop. And the first is, while these photographs are going by, can I just ask you um, to say something about the photographer John Donat, whose work is so respected by us architects because of the way he's able to include the human figure um, with dignity in his architectural photographs. And I think you knew John Donat <coughs> very well. Yes. One of the features of this building, and I think one that has perhaps helped to make it what it is. Is that better? Um, I, one fact that I think contributed to making this building what it is, I was in my mid-twenties when I worked on it and designed it. I had two very good friends with whom I was a student and always worked with, who came in and worked on this project with me afterwards. But there's a whole host of people who, engineers, client, you know, people in Trinity, who made this project possible. And looking back on it after a rather long time, um, it strikes me that it's, it's really about the people and the care that all of them, in their different ways, contributed. And I think the, the quality of the building, which is perhaps why it is considered to be successful, um, I think depends on all, these, all this care uh, that was put into it. We, we had been students together, had worked together as students, and had, a, had stored a whole, whole you know, a huge amount of material that we wanted to express in a, in a royal building. And this was our first opportunity to do it. So you spoke about the sort of hidden invisible building in here. There's another hidden invisible building of, of all, the, all the, I would say, loving care that was in, invested in, in this. And 
I think it's important to remember, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll mention some of the individuals who, who contributed this, but um, I think that's one of the most important things about the building. Um, well, well, you I, might, your two yeah. partners. Yes. I mean, you designed Well, them. I should single them out, of course. We'll start with that. Yes. The A, B, and the K. A, B, and K. Um, you started it on your own. As a design, I'd, there are many things about this building which would be a sort of textbook example of what one should not do. Um, I designed it without seeing the site. Excellent. <laughs> um, it was a. It, although. It, it was a competition, which meant that the way one worked was very influenced by this. That um, okay. <laughs> I, I won't wave it about as much. Um, so there wasn't the possibility of that sort of dialogue with the client, which, as architects, we've always wanted and in a way respected as being the source of, of, of ideas. But there was a sort of unspoken dialogue, I think, and the, uh, there was a very good written brief which made it possible to really interpret and understand what the college was looking for without having the opportunity of talking about it. Um, unusual that a brief should be so precise and, and useful, you know, it contained all the right, it, I mean, for example, the, the main thrust of the, of the brief was that this should be a building that represented the 20th century as well as the 19th century and 18th century buildings adjoining it. That's quite a challenge, but it's a very welcome challenge, it's what one wants to do. So things like that, that that all of those things kind of moulded the building into what it has become. So you started working alone in New York? I was working, I, was, I had a job with Marcel Breuer, a renowned architect in New York, um, which was a you know, tremendously attractive situation for me as a young architect. Um, I, in my spare time, I then did the, the competition for this building. Why? Uh, because, uh, because the three of us had decided, in, without having any idea about how, <laughs> that we were going to set up a practice together. That was a given. We were going to do it. <laughs> We didn't, you know, as I say, we had no idea what that meant. Um, the other two, Richard and Peter, were working in a small office in London trying to start a practice. I wasn't helping because I was in New York and I didn't want to leave the job there. So I sort of felt guilty about that and felt I had to do my bit. I, so I thought, well, what, what I can do is a competition which then I would pass over to the, to the partnership. I mean, it was a sort of theoretical thing. I mean, the chances of that actually coming to anything were remote. There were, at that time, there were 350 entries into, the, into what was an international open competition. Um, so I had one chance in 350 of actually achieving something. Um, I had I tried many competitions before as a way of generating work for this fledgling practice. Um, I'd never been satisfied with the outcome and I'd never sent one off. This time I sort of took a solemn vow that whatever I felt about it, whatever, it looked, whatever I did, I was going to send it in. <laughs> so that's how this project came into being. You'll never win it unless you send it in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
that's indeed true. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I had, and when you won it, and then your partners yeah. had to work with you to collaborate, to participate? Yes, Can, indeed. Which became an intense collaboration. Because it was your first job? It was an intense collaboration and it was a lifelong co collaboration which ended only very recently with yeah. the death of one of my partners. Yeah. Um, it was, I think it worked as a partnership because it was first and foremost a friendship and it remained a friendship through all kinds of vicissitudes which are inevitable. Um, so, yes, I submitted this and was blown over by the news that I'd won this competition. It was a complete shock and astonishment. Um, and sent it, you know, having sent it in. <laughs> so, when you go around the building now, do you say to yourself, do you look at parts of the building and say, thank you, Peter, thank you, Richard? <laughs> um, <laughs> No. <laughs> um, I, 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 I looked at the whole building. I had this idea that Peter Ahrens was interested in bay windows. Or... No. No, that's not, that's, it's true in a way, but that's not really how it happened. Um, the three of us worked very close together, together. It was our only major project when we started. So it was possible, just from the practicalities point of view, yeah. to invest an enormous amount of time and so on, <coughs> you know, concern for every detail in the process. A lot of it was discussed and we went back and forth and looked at everything a hundred times. And everybody made their contributions in a way where I think at the end we didn't know whose idea this was or that was. Um, yes, I could give you some examples of where perhaps there was a lead from here or from there. But in a way I don't want to do that because that's not how it came about. I can about. see that. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Right, but Richard Burton was interested in involving contemporary art or art into architecture. Yes, that probably came later there. Later. Later um, in your practice? During, the, uh, yes, I mean after this building was designed. I see. But, but he certainly had a major interest in that and certainly at the later stages when, I mean one of the lovely things I think about this building is the amount of artwork and so on which, um, which gives me a, the, a cue to mention somebody else. But I, I want to mention a number of people who contributed to this building. Yeah. And one, one of them is Professor George Dawson who was professor of genetics at Trinity College, a scientist. But he, he was like the artistic conscience of Trinity College. Um, he started this, the, the students, the gallery. He was responsible for the Douglas Hyde Gallery being built because he raised funding from the Irish Arts Council to support what, the, what Trinity was doing. So we owe a huge amount to him He's not with us any longer, but it, it's, he's sort of there. And was George Dawson involved in the building committee that you were reporting to? Or? Well, I have a terrible memory, but I don't think so. So uh, his interest was in bringing the art into the building? He became a very close friend. Yeah. He was very supportive of what we were trying. That's how I remember him. But uh, he then also brought all this, art, you know, all these artworks. I mean, you'll still see a lot of them around in the building now that he got for the, by, by fair means or foul, I don't know how he did it. But he, he developed the most incredible. When the art building collection. opened, there was a Henry Moore, King and Queen, outside the door. We, he persuaded, well, it was also Richard Burton's mother who knew Henry Moore, <laughs> but... Um, My mother knows an artist. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yes, you know, one way or another we persuaded Henry Moore to lend this. He wouldn't give it, but he lent it. And 
I hoped for a long time that he would forget that he'd lived. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> Where will I leave that cake, please? <laughs> yes. But actually, I think that Pomodoro is yeah. so good in its location. Because I think we're talking not about just an isolated artwork, but a, a dialogue between an artwork and a building that I don't think we could have done better. That was George. I mean, he found that, chose it, and made it happen. And um, there was uh, Dr. Park, you wanted to mention? Yes. I mean, Dr. Park was the librarian in Trinity College at the time. Like most people in Trinity, he, he was not a professional librarian. He was, a, he was an academic professor of classics. And um, this was a sort of side job he had of, of, of steering the building through. Uh, he immortalized himself in the annals of ABK by when we were trying to sell the project to, to the building committee and advise them. Um, we had this idea of this is particularly in relation to the stair in the East Pavilion where we did what obviously was a relatively bold move of putting a 20th century concrete structure inside the old library building. And we, we were saying all the good things we could think of on the spur of the moment to persuade him that this was a good thing. And we said it would be very exciting. And he quietly said, well, that's all very well if excitement is what you're after. <laughs> And that's the main, I mean, it's well, those few moments that stick in the mind, you know, I've not forgotten it, as you see. So you say that now, when you're reviewing designs, you say that's all very well if excitement is what you're after. If it's a new so, standard. I mean, it was such a subtle remark because yeah. it was, he, he was not against excitement, but he was against a relatively sort of superficial attempt at, at, at creating it, which doesn't work. So he, he, he accepted the proposal, so he was not against doing something uh, pretty outlandish at that time. But he just so sort of had this balance. Hear, it's so interesting to hear about the people involved in making the project happen, because, of course, it takes a convergence of... It's not architects who make yeah. architecture happen. It it's all it. kinds of people, um, and it's maybe because of my age, and I've been looking because I've been invited really to sort of think about the Berkeley yeah. Library again and see it with fresh eyes, which is a great privilege really to be able to do that. Um, I'm very aware of all these inputs from different people, who, in the end, it's, it's all of that that made the building what it is. It may be because of your age that you're thinking about those people, but many people here would be thinking about your age when you won the bloody well. thing. <laughs> <laughs> so you must have had people That's... who said, let's rely on this inexperienced architect yes. who's never built a building, who has also not persuaded himself to enter many competitions, <laughs> dissatisfied as he is with his work. <laughs> let's allow this architect to build the most significant site in the most significant place. That was huge. So, you met, so you, there were people around who said, go with it. Well, the chairman of the assessors for the competition was Hugh Castle. Hugh Castle, yeah. Um, who, again, became a lifelong friend because of this contribution he made. But he said to the college, you know, you've had a competition, you've now got an architect, let him run, you know, don't get in his way. Let him do his thing. And the college, partly, partly perhaps from ignorance, I mean, things were very different in those days. Nobody understood what was involved in making a building like this. Um, but also f with, I think, great courage, decided to take that advice and they let a few, you know, they didn't inhibit the design in any way. On the contrary, everybody was very supportive of it. And I understand that, correct me if I'm wrong, that the college had a relationship with Crampton's contractors. And uh, they felt, uh, no, is I that think, wrong? They felt uh, that Crampton's would look after an inexperienced architect. <laughs> is that wrong? That may be. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but Compton's Other well. Other do look after actors <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Camp, I mean, Compton's were builders. They were not contractors. Um, okay. And they were run by engineers and not quantity surveyors. For those who work in the building industry will understand what that means. <laughs> um, so, yes, I mean, Crampton's were a family business with, they did all the work themselves. I mean, there were wonderful joinery shops and, you know, a, a, a fantastic team came with Crampton's. The story about that is that we had invited, the tenders were invited from six companies. We pre-selected companies. And when the tenders came in, Crampton's were the second lowest. <laughs> they were not the lowest. <laughs> um, the lowest was an unknown firm that did civil engineering work mainly. And we said, we've got to have Crampton's. This was absolutely not done. It was against the code of tendering and everything. The, the, the building industry was out, outraged by this. But it's probably the best, one of the best decisions we've ever made because Crampton's were extraordinary to work with. If I can tell some stories to illustrate that. The first time I came on a site visit to see what they'd done, I said, those columns are not good enough, knock them down. Here was this young yeah. whippersnapper who'd never done anything, <laughs> telling them to knock their columns down. Uh, but they did. And the next lot was superb. And from then on, whenever concrete was cast on the site, the site would stop work, all the workmen would gather around and see how the concrete had turned out. And that generated a sort of spirit of, you know, down to the people casting the concrete, they, everybody cared. Yeah. Partly financial, of course, but it was also, you know, they, they really liked working on something. Partly financial in case you condemned another column. <laughs> well, that's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, builders, clients, engineers? Yes. Um, if I can start with the services engineers, they w we, and one of the factors in this is that because we came in from London, we were not an Irish company, we had very little, we had, I'd never been to Ireland. Um, we tried to choose some Irish engineers. And we, there was one firm in Ireland who had an international reputation, which was at that time called Steenson, Varming and Mulcahy. Yeah. They had done the bus station in Dublin, which you may know, which at that time was the only notable modern building in Ireland. Um, and so we, we I, I phoned them up out of the blue and said, you know, could you take on a job with us? Sean Mulcahy, he answered the phone and he said, no way, I can't, we've got much too much work. We can't take anything else on. But what is the project? So I said, the library eternity. I do it, he said. Sudden change of policy. So he became a, a, a yeah. very important member of this team and also a friend and, yeah. um, and a very good en engineer. Sadly, he gave up engineering and took up art, painting, <laughs> and became quite a good artist. <laughs> but he was lost to the engineering profession because he was an outstanding engineer. And the structural engineer? Was structural was Samuel, Felix Samuel. That's a, um, a newbie, was yeah, Frank, Frank, Frank newbie. Yeah. Uh, at, um, there. He, they had taught us at the AA and therefore were the only engineers we really knew, and they, had a very, they were very good engineers, and Felix Andrelli was an outstanding engineer. So what you're helping me to do is to sort of build up a picture of the team, because it, it, this is a team. So concern. does the project ever go over budget? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's unheard of. And when it did go over budget, how? How did you manage to I have to, I have to admit it went fairly substantially over budget. <laughs> <laughs> and the story is touched with that. Is I, I saw Neil Collin here in, in the audience. His father, Lyle Collin, was brought onto the building committee by the college 
as he's an engineering graduate, he was an engineering graduate of Trinity, and as such, Trinity thought, well, he must know something about building, because, I mean, nobody <laughs> in the college knew anything about building. So he was brought on. And when we submitted the thing, and as you say, budget questions arose, um, he... The promise he, is listening to this now. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is how it's done. <laughs> um, We more or less panicked when the tenders came in, went into a huddle, big huddle, and produced long schedules of cost savings and so on of how we could bring the building back within the budget. Yeah. Lyle Collin on the committee was sitting there in the background, didn't say a word, he bided his time. When everybody was tired and had been discussing all this for hours and was thoroughly bored with you know, how to, he just very simply said, gentlemen, and I think it was gentlemen at those days, <laughs> um, we have a problem. The building costs more than the budget. There are two things we could do. We could either cut the cost of the building or we could get more money. I suggest we get more money. <laughs> and every, everybody was so tired they just agreed. <laughs> so that's how, and looking back, you know, the sums of money involved. Um, I mean, I know there's inflation and so on to take into, but even for that, at that time, I mean, the whole building cost six hundred thousand know. pounds. So it would have been crazy. But but he, with that little remark, he enabled us to, in a sense, use the best materials. That, I mean, the bronze windows, the granite walls, <laughs> the curved glass. I mean, those will all last forever. And if anything is value for money, they must be. But, of course, they cost more than had been allowed for. They cost more than the average window would have cost. And the stone is thick? The stone is thick. We didn't like the idea of hanging sheets of stone on the outside of the building, so we built it, you know, it's a, it's a cavity wall, and the outer wall is, is, is blocks of granite. Because I think one of the, I mean, I was saying this at the beginning, I think one of the enduring beauties of the building is its solidity. Yes. It's a sculpted yeah. building. And May I say something about that? Yeah. Because you're quite right. I think that is one of the major features of the building. And I think that that's what happened to me personally, particularly when, when I came to Ireland for the first time and I saw the site. Yeah. The competition design was a precast concrete structure and it was a bit relatively spindly, of sort of columns and beams and so on. It wasn't great solid walls. And I looked at the site and said, no, you know, it's got to be a massive. I looked at the buildings on either side, the, 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 the library, the old library, and the um, museum building. And they needed something solid and substantial. So you said to Trinity, I've never done a building before. I've won this competition, and I've changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, more or less. And they said, go ahead, Paul. Well, we were helped in that. We, we, were, helped in, yeah. <laughs> we were helped in that uh, by Hugh Casson, I think, particularly, saying, you, you've chosen an architect, not a design. Yeah. Let the architect do his thing. So, in a way, they were prepared to... But I, but I agree, it was a, also a relatively rash thing to do, to having got this competition winning design to then change it. But that's a whole interesting topic because in some ways it didn't change at all. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the appearance of the building, if you're just walking by and looking at it, it's changed dramatically. But the project hasn't changed. The you whole organisation... You, you should speak about the idea well, you had for the organisation. I think the things that, if you like, won the competition, certainly that for me are the are the, um, the main benefits of this particular design, yeah. um, are that the huge bulk of it is buried in the ground because there was a, a terrible problem as to how to put all this amount of building onto that site. 
that solved it at a stroke. It also clarified the building. I mean, the, the, the brief for the building falls into three categories. The book storage, which was the basement, the reading areas, which are all, if you like, in another box held up off the ground, and then the middle floor between those, which was all the catalogue and making the library work, all the functional, the, the, the management of the library and so on. So the idea came fairly early on to organise the building into those three z vertical zones. But then you pushed back two parts of it and pulled forward. Well, that's because it sort of asked for that. <laughs> Were there many schemes in the competition that did that? Or have you seen the others? I, I did schemes? see the others, but I, I, you don't I honestly don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because that, I mean, yeah. it's the building with the drawer yes. pulled out that makes this whole scheme so strong. Well, it's this extra space, which is the forecourt to the building, yeah. which is on the, on the podium. And I think we got the height of the, the podium right. Yeah. So that it's solid enough to be a reality, you know, it's, it's, it's there, there's no question about it being there, but it, it allows that to be read as a space more than as another block. So, in a way, that was a sort of, I think it was, well, though I say so myself, it was a clever way of accommodating the volume of, of space that the college wanted. So, having, on that side. having said it's a solid building, let me just say, well, one other aspect. It may be a solid building, but it's filled with light on the inside. You want to talk about uh, yes, light? Yes. I think buildings are made of light. You know, we think they're made of stone and wood and so on. They're not. They're made of light. And that is how you perceive a building. So nothing would in a way exist without light and the way it, light works. And we spent a lot of time studying the way the light would come into the building. Um, what is interesting, I think, about light is when it's reflected off surfaces, because then, of course, it reveals everything else. If you just make a hole in a wall or in the ceiling, all you get is glare. So how do you modulate that light so that, A, you don't get glare, but B, you get a, a, a pleasant um, effect of light in the, on a soft, a gentle. And light. then readers choose their favourite places in relation to the variety of the light? When the building was first built, I decided to go in there at nine in the morning and see the, the, the readers coming into the building and what they did. And they all made beelines to their favourite place. <laughs> Some of the favourite places were the ones we thought were least good, but even so, you know, and I, so that's the other things I should have mentioned perhaps, that, I mean, variety is a huge factor in this, that the building contains a variety of spaces uh, which allows people to choose uh, and to have a meaningful choice, it's not just so another can one. I, I mean, we're going to involve a few more people in this yeah. conversation, but before we do, can I just ask you, about building in Ireland at that time. Yes. I mean, your practice went on to thrive in Ireland. But yes. But just the feeling that you felt of the opportunity well, of building in Ireland? I have to say, above all, it was just no opportunity of building. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, what I've come to feel about Ireland doesn't have this terrible relationship with tradition which England does. Uh, I think it is more possible to introduce new ideas in Ireland. I may be wrong as an outsider, but that's my feeling, that there was a, a more ready acceptance that this building didn't have to pretend to be an old building. You mean there was a forward-looking aspiration? I think so. And you're suggesting in the home country there was a over the shoulder? Well, we had, I mean, Prince Charles hadn't happened yet, but he, 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 was, he was getting ready to appear. And, you know, he represents a whole sort of attitude 
uh, of going back to the past. So there was a little event you might not remember in 1984 when you were doing the National Gallery. I'm sure you've blotted it <laughs> out of your mind. Prince Charles uh, assessed your extension to the National Gallery as yes. a monstrous carbuncle yes. on the face of a well-loved and an elegant friend. Yeah. Which uh, he didn't like the project. <laughs> <laughs> we got the impression he wasn't very <laughs> and, keen on it. And that must have had a... We did point out to him that the carbuncle is a rare jewel. <laughs> <laughs> but that must have had an impact. And you were still working in Trinity at that point. Trinity no, that clients, was a, well. Tr yes, we were doing other things in Trinity. And certainly. so Trinity, just discuss that. Professor Shanley, who was head of the dental school, which we then later designed at the other end of the college, um, he, as it were, doubled his support for ABK when he heard that Prince Charles had said, as an Irish Republican, he was going to absolutely refuse this. <laughs> intervention um, but uh, I mean I, I don't know how, how true all these things are <laughs> but there must be something in it well I'm I'm sorry to have to bring that up but you know it's an important story and but, the continuation sorry. of your practice in Ireland with well, John and Robert still goes on in, in the it, civic it and education does, world in spite of his best efforts to <laughs> stop us but we will we had a difficult time where we didn't get new commissions for a long time after he'd made his famous speech. Yeah. But all our existing clients stuck with us. And so we survived on that for long enough until new work came in. And yes, I, I was, as I said earlier, I haven't been here for a long time, but I was very delighted to see how our office in Dublin is thriving. So let me invite a few other guests to the rostrum. Um, Shane and Moshi and Karen are going to join us uh, just now. Helen has already introduced our our speakers, and we have been asked um, we have been asked to make sure that the audience can also hear what we're saying. So Karen, okay. who knows so much about libraries, <laughs> could I ask you to follow that in some way, or? Uh. Well, not sure. Follow that, indeed. But um, I will. I will carry on. Uh, it's very interesting as the librarian sitting here amongst an amphibian of architects, or uh, whatever the collective term for architects is. My interest is obviously very much as a client. And one of the things I had thought, and it's been fascinating listening to Paul Korolek talking, was about his library influences. But before I came here, I went to the exhibition at the Irish Architectural Archive, which I thoroughly recommend if you haven't been. And I feel it sort of answered my question. And, the, and you might think it answered the question because I saw um, illustrations of work by Marcel Breuer and Lutyens, and, uh, but actually it answered my question because I read the letter that Paul Korolek wrote when he was offered the commission and it became obvious, uh, I think he'll allow me to say this, that probably he hadn't had much time to have had any influences on the library side at all. <laughs> To hear, understand what you're saying. Hard to hear. Sorry, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, it's probably harder for the people at the side. I had a number of questions for Paul and cheated, I suppose, by doing the C's. And obviously, one of them is client, the sort of client architect relationship. But I wanted to roll it out a bit more into competitions because the fact that this was a competition was very important. And I work a lot with library buildings, and I have noted that in the rest of Europe, perhaps more so than certainly in the UK and possibly Ireland, they have far more competitions. Uh, and I wondered, there are pros and cons of this. One of the big advantages is precisely what happened here, that you get a young architect with lots of good new ideas, rather than always picking the library building design expert. One of the disadvantages, so that's the advantage, one of the disadvantages, speaking as a client, is the danger with competitions is that the 
architect-client relationship becomes very much with the, the absolute sort of upper echelons, you know, with respect, the provosts, the financial people. And I obviously am thinking of the end user. Paul did say that one of the advantages of inflexibility was that the librarians couldn't change the building. <laughs> this was in his previous interview. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, thank you very much. But he's got a point. I wish we could extend it to other things. But I would just like to ask you, Paul, if you could comment on the advantages of a competition, but also whether you do feel, does it stand a bit in the way of talking directly to the end users rather than the commissioners of the building? I think that's quite true. I mean, there's a huge limitation in the competition system that it tends to discourage the possibility of the dialogue. But I mean, we in a sense solve that by sort of starting again and having the dialogue. In the end, I think it depends on the individuals and the teams. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you have to have that dialogue. So it doesn't matter how difficult it is, you do it. And so somehow the team has to make it work. Um, I, I think each individual case is actually different. Um, but, but yes, in general terms, it is, of course, a disadvantage that you have to, in a way, firm things up sooner than you would like to in some way because you haven't had the chance to, to have that. Thank you. Am I allowed one more question, John? Very short. Very short. Okay. Uh, my other interest, really, is the business of extending an important building. And I have to say, 60s architecture, library architecture, is fascinating for somebody interested in library buildings because so much happened in the 60s. Basil Spence at Sussex and Edinburgh, Powell and Moya, you know, there was a lot happening. Uh, and, but then we come, libraries have changed, and Helen uh, Shenton touched on this in the introduction. We're dealing with a very different sort of library, although we still want a lot of the same librariness, if you want. So my question, other question is about extensions. Uh, ABK have been extended here. They've been extended at Portsmouth, I think, as well. Uh, and Paul had mentioned when he was looking at, if you like, extending the library, the 18th century library here, he more or less said, this is too perfect, so we don't extend it. We create a new building in relation to it. Uh, so I just again wonder, how do you feel about being extended in your various libraries? I think it's exactly as you say. I mean, there's no way you could do a, con a conventional sort of extension to that building. So I think building a separate building and having a secret, largely underground link connecting it in was obviously the way to solve that. And I, I, I'm still sure that is the, was the right approach. I think each building is different, but I mean, that is a very perfect sort of symmetrical, pure building. You can't just stick a bit onto it. Yep. And how do you like being extended? Uh, well, sorry. <laughs> I, I don't have any problem with it. It's, it's not my problem, it's somebody else's. <laughs> Um, a few remarks, uh, just a couple that, that are inspired that follow up from what has just been said there um, and said um, by, by uh, Helen in her introduction uh, that she's a steward of this building. And I recall 20 years ago in 1997 um, when uh, there were, uh, the, the university had fallen out of love with the Barclay Library at that time. And it's amazing to see that a generation later it has fallen back in love with the building. Um, at that time, Dokomomo uh, fought a big fight to save most of the columns in the entry hall, which were to connect down uh, into the usher. And in the competition uh, for, that, for the usher library, uh, Aarons Burton and Karlek had actually proposed that instead of building more on the green space of Trinity, which was vital to retain for the whole city, um, that they would extend the building or build the usher actually underneath Fellow Square. And that was, that, was Paul's, um, that was Paul's idea for how to extend uh, the Barclay Library, not to, in effect. Um, but 
John, well, some of the things about the architecture um, that, that strike me are things that uh, John and Paul have already uh, spoken about. And I think the most striking thing to me about the building when you look at it is its uh, informal solemnity. And that's a very difficult trick to pull off, to be both informal and casual and welcoming, and to be solemn and serious and intended for all time. And it's a trick that most mid-century modern architecture was unable to accomplish. Um, and it leads to this idea that this is actually a very complex building. There's great complexity in it. Um, in the context which has already been described about um, the, the creation of this um, wonderful uh, platform um, that connects the, the corners of Trinity in a unique way, which is the special thing uh, in terms of the urban space and the continuity of space in Trinity. It's actually how you negotiate those right angles between the squares and to have a completely new twist on it that is within the tradition uh, of the bones of Trinity and yet brings something completely original to the, to, the, to the table was extraordinary. In the form of the building, which on the outside appears very simple, particularly, particularly my mic, yeah, back. It appears very simple, particularly in relation to the, the two stories of the reading rooms. On the outside, you think this is actually, yes, a recognizably mid-20th century building. Um, in the massing, in its relation of the scale of the Barclay to the scale in particular of the engineering, the, the museum building beside it, uh, and the materials. If you look at the uh, museum building, since it has been restored and cleaned up, um, the color of the granite cladding, the solid granite wall of the Barclay is identical to the solid wall of more than a hundred years before um, in the museum building. And the color of the concrete is identical, in my view, to the Portland stone. So though these are like, it, it, it's completely modern, it's, it is, it's like a, a, a blood brother of the museum building. Um, it's modern on the outside and has often been called, including by myself, gently brutalist, but I think that's probably an unfair description, an overly simplistic description to call it a brutalist building, because that stands for a sort of type of mid-20th century architecture. And the Barclay Library is the antithesis of most of the buildings of that time, in that it is not in the least bit mechanistic. Um, and that's something that happened after the competition win, because the co original competition entry was an assembled building. And the real importance of moving from precast concrete, which Paul had been told when he arrived in Ireland, the Irish industry was incapable of supplying. And that had also been a contributor to the move to in situ. Allowed the building to change from something that was assembled to something that was sculpted or molded. And allowed uh, Aarons Burton and Carlyle to bring out uh, their interest in a sort of an organic architecture. In their student days at the AA in the 50s, they were called the Country Boys because they were very into the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright, which was anathema in the AA of the time, uh, which was uh, driven largely by the purism of the 20s and 30s of Le Corbusier. And combined with their prescient interest in Wright and this sort of informality, Corp himself overthrew his own theories in the late 1950s particularly with the construction of Ronchamp, which I think liberated um, Corb and caused chaos in academic circles because nobody knew how to square Le Corbusier's theory with this new building. And I think there are many similarities in between. I think Aaron Spurton and Carlack were almost uniquely placed to appreciate what the liberation of Ronchamp meant. Um, and there are many similarities if you look at the way the light uh, it comes between the roof and the wall at Ronchon on the horizontal, it comes on the vertical in, um, it, it, it comes on the wall joint in Ronchon, it comes on the ceiling joint uh, in, in, in the Barclay Library. If you look at the windows that look down, if you look at the top lighting, there are, there are many things. And Paul and his partners at ABK had made a road trip to Ronchon immediately after that was completed. So it's a very interesting melding, I think, of um, uh, uh, ideas that were new and revolutionary and radical in architecture that most people hadn't yet understood um, how to handle or what they meant. 
And the result is a luminous cave, um, and it is kind of a, a labyrinth, which is extraordinary. If you think of modern architecture interiors of that time, they're almost all a kind of a universal space, a single space, um, a repetitive module that creates a space. Here, it's not, and that labyrinthine quality um, is, I think, well, it, it's not unique, but it, it, it's extremely early in showing a new possibility for modern architecture. Um, one which carries a metaphor, I think, for a, a library. The library and the labyrinth are well understood um, and uh, suggests that you actually have to discover yourself and you have to discover education through this building. It's not all laid out for you on an open plan where everything is presented a la carte. Here you have to assemble your own, uh, your own knowledge uh, and you can get lost, which is a wonderful opportunity. <laughs> Uh, in contemporary architecture. Well, Shane, I just have to ask the, to pass the microphone to Roshi, who is dealing now with the libraries, the original library, and some conversation with this one. Yeah, I well, I think when we um, <clears throat> when we came to Trinity, we were reminded by um, everybody that there is one library in Trinity, and if there is the old library, and there is the Berkeley Library. And I, I think maybe what that brought up for us was um, that Trinity is very much a continuum, and that's actually what is a wonderful about it. You've got the, the old buildings, you've got the Barclay, which, you know, up in the 60s, so there's this continuity, and there's a respect, I suppose, for the building of each generation. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> the, the way that the Barclay deals with the older buildings, you know, that, that step back, the creation of the podium where you're slightly elevated, so you're looking into the four courtyards. It's a, it's a wonderful party. Then there's, there's the surprise, if you like, of the entrance being on the axis of the printing house. Um, and then going into the building, um, it, it, for me, I mean, there's also the surprise of going into that large room with the, with the roof lights and then kind of going in around to the various corners and I suppose looking in the detail at how the, the desks are kind of created, the concrete walls, is kind of a joy about it and reading about, you know, in the young practice, I could imagine everybody drawing through. You can feel it in the building. I, I think you can feel it. And even like, there's almost like the intuition, I think, that... Um, the flexibility doesn't mean everything has to be the same. That real flexibility actually is maybe allowing the idiosyncrasies because, of course, we're not all the same. And that's what allows, like, think of it, 50 years later, you know, we're talking about this library and it's still a, a very, very modern library in many ways. So I, I just wanted to ask one thing. It kind of struck me. Or I, one of the things I, I wonder about in making the building, you know, you're coming to Ireland. The industry here was very... You couldn't even do precast, uh, and it wasn't very organised or very industrialised, maybe. And I was wondering whether maybe that more handmade or kind of crafty kind of building had that any effect on how you developed the detail. I think it did. Um, I'm not a historian, so I would find it difficult to give sort of a detailed answer to this, but. I, th I think it certainly did. It was all part of the ethos of that time, I think, as well. Um, but it made, I mean, sitting here looking at uh, one of these tables that we designed. <laughs> um, we designed that table because there was nobody in Ireland making any off-the-peg tables that would have been <laughs> as good as that. So, in a way, it played, as architects, we wanted to design everything, you know. Um, it played into our hands because it made sense to do that because this so it was also the question of what skills existed i mean they you know we 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 haven't said this yet the the, the granite walls um, we opened up a quarry in in the Wicklow mountains to get the granite nobody was digging for granite any longer it, obviously they had in the past and it was all very you know, the traditional material, but it had, it had died because it wasn't being 
being used. So uh, we were really interested in finding th those sort of um, methods that had disappeared, but which were all latent in, in, this, in what was available. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've sat here for a little while. We've kept Paul here for a little while. I just want to remind you before we close this evening that uh, 57 years ago, this young fella, wise as he was, experienced as he was, disinclined towards excitement as he was, <laughs> romantic as he was, clever as he was, came to make this building in this place. And we, um, on behalf of the architects who followed you here in Ireland, I think we just want to pay tribute to you for the inspiration that your building has provided, for the motivation that your building has provided, and actually for the confidence that your building has given to future following generations of architects in Ireland to do their best and to follow you. Tribute to you, and thank you for coming here tonight. saying to me that we have a few minutes if there are people in the audience who wanted to ask Paul a question. So we have time for questions from the audience. Have we got a question from the audience? Yes, sir. Two, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, <laughs> could, could we have a comment on the, uh, the inspiration that the um, this museum building uh, gave to call to Paul for the um, uh, air conditioning system in the in the library. And the other one is, please tell us the story about yourself and Henry Moore. <laughs> the first question is about the inspiration that the museum building gave to the ventilation, yes. and the second is a story about yourself and Henry Moore. <laughs> well. I can't talk in detail about the ventilation system, but yes, we have been interested for a long time in using the form of the building more intelligently in relation to environmental issues, and that has come back into fashion very much. But at, at that time, when we do, were doing the, the Barclay Library design, uh, nobody paid any attention to that. We could do whatever we liked. and. Environment, environmental issues were just not yeah. taken into account. So in a way, things have moved on and reached a much more interesting stage, I think. Um, and was there something about Henry Moore that you hadn't said that no <laughs> <laughs> known? <laughs> well... Travis McConnell, Henry yes. Moore, and the architect. I the riddle of the... <laughs> <laughs> Henry Moore, the Provost and the architect. Yes. I'm afraid I don't know. The King and Queen was sort of my personal favourite sculpture in the whole world, more or less. So when we approached Henry Moore as to whether we could have something, that became a possibility, so I jumped at it. He would only lend it, he wouldn't give it. So from day one, 
it was there on loan. And as I, we had no idea how long he would leave it there. And as I said, we <laughs> rather hoped he'd sort of forget about it, but he didn't. And so the, the moment came when he wanted back. Yeah. Um, so I, I can't really tell I think there's a story that. going around Trinity that you're not privy to. <laughs> <laughs> that may well be the case. Maybe. Probably more than one. <laughs> Can we have another question? Here in the center. One moment. It, it. Can't hear you, I'm afraid. No, she, she's yeah. Yeah. Passion for his building, I think it's just superlative in every way, and it's um, it's almost Egyptian in its majesty and purity of line from the exterior, and inside it's just um, just light shining down, and in this lattice of honeycomb genius. And um, I looked at your one or two of your books for the practice, the ABK books, and. Um, I saw a little drawing of your thesis of a church, and I thought I could see there, there was something in the podium in the front, and just the, the way you fastened the, the roof structure. I thought that, and also I'm curious, there's la less information about your early biography than your wonderful partners, who I, I know you're very passionately um, close team, but, um, there's very little information about you, and I thought, I know you did study in Paris, and you had studied sculpture and uh, art, and I thought, artist studios, you know, nobody, there is no building I, I know of, or, and I've lived in other countries, that I have such control of understanding of light, and I th I'm thinking of either religious kind of control of light, or an artist studio, or some kind of magical blend of of those, and I wonder, do you have anything to say about your experiences in your youth, and um, maybe even of your early childhood? I don't know. That's a fair question. That, that's not so much a question as, it, <laughs> <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a huge compliment for which thank you. She thinks you came to Dublin to build your student thesis. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in some ways, I think we were trying to build our student theses. We were trying to embody the ideas that were sort of latent in all that. We have time for one more question. One Thank you. I was lucky enough to become a student just after the, the Barclay opened, so I enjoyed four years um, reading in it um, as a student, it's particularly the Morris reading room with the periodicals there. And then I was especially lucky, I was able to work for the library for the next 40 plus years. I only retired recently. The thing about it is the Barclay was designed well before the internet, before Google and all of that. And over that time, the library has been adaptable and flexible to cope with all the internet. I remember in the early 70s, there were drip feeds of wires from all over the place because the internet was delivered by wires and now it's all wireless. And we're opening up the spaces again. Are you surprised at how flexible your building is 50 years on? Or do you anticipate that? Will it still be flexible in another 50 years when there will probably be I don't know, brain implants of, of, of books and things. Sorry, I missed that. Will your building still be flexible? He's the librarian who's been working here yeah. all his life. Yeah. <laughs> People are very flexible. <laughs> so I think, in a way, it's a great privilege as an architect to be allowed to put a building on this planet of ours and to occupy a certain amount of space with it. How that is then used, you know, one is setting the stage for people to do what they want to do, need to do, can do. Um, and so there's, there's a dialogue there between, you know, what, how subtly the stage is set up so that it allows for all these 
activities and, and more than activities, just it allows people to be what they are. So I think some of these detailed questions about this or that are actually much deeper than about what the whole thing is about. Um, there's always this bigger dimension of what what is really needed and what one, what can one do with with the state with the framework within which life will go on and that's the privilege of the architect it is the privilege of the architect indeed it's a tremendous privilege and slightly awesome really if one <laughs> well our privilege that you got it so right on your first go. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Uh, what an honor it is for us to have this man here with us tonight. Um, we wish you well. We're grateful. It's an thank honor you. to be here and a pleasure to be here. Thank you.